our Bibles to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 10. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. The title of the message is, Don't Give Up, Don't Give Up. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Don't Give Up. The Bible says, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Brother Caleb, can you please pray for the message? Dear Father, thank you for sending us from hell. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you, Lord. Uh, everybody who's here today, we thank you for each and every person that's able to make it. For those who couldn't, for health reasons or for whatever reason, we pray that you please be with them. Please help them and bless them, Lord Father. As we ask Pastor Jay preaches your word today, Lord, uh, Galatians chapter 6, Father, we pray that you please fill them with the Holy Spirit. Um, whatever preaching it may be, we pray that you please open our hearts so that we can accept it and really apply it to our lives, Lord, and encourage us or whatever you may want to do with us, Lord. Please help us to be willing to serve you and help us to submit to your will, Lord. Uh, protect us for the rest of the day. Uh, keep, uh, fill all of us with the Holy Spirit, yes. especially the preacher, Lord. In Jesus Christ, name we pray. Amen. 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 Don't give up. It's a very common thing that you hear. You hear from your parents, you hear from your teachers, you hear from your coaches, you hear from everyone. Many, many times you hear the phrase, don't give up. As Christians, it's no different. You can't give up. A lot of Christians quit. A lot of Christians don't finish. If we were to have all the people who found the truth and came to church, you know, our church, and who stayed and who would have stayed, you know, it'll be, this place will be filled with people. You know, it'll be like a standing room only. You know. But that's not the reality. Majority of the people seems like more than half for sure, do not finish. They give up in the middle. Some people give up within a few days. Some people give up within a month, maybe a year or two. But some people even give up after 20, 30 years. And that is a sad thing, sad thing to see, especially in Christian world, especially in Bible-believing world. And we're not even talking about you know, just fundamentalists out there. People who believe that King James Bible is the word of God, they believe in dispensationalism, they believe in street preaching visitation, they believe in the right doctrines, but they give up. When you come to church and when you have found the truth, I'm sure you made a decision, you made a commitment that I want to finish whatever I've started. I want to finish this faith. I want to stand for the King James Bible. I mean, let's look at verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. It just tells you that many people do faint and quit. 
because people get weary, and that's a natural thing. In your Christian walk, whether you are a mature Christian, whether you're a baby Christian, or you're in between, you're going to get weary. And besides from spiritual life, everyday life, you can't always have good days. You have bad days. You have good and bad days. Many people who came to church, a lot of them, when they do give up their faith, when they quit, it's for a lot of petty reasons. It's not really about doctrinal issues in many times. They quit because of bitterness. They quit because someone did not treat them according to how they wanted them to be treated. I mean, we have like stories, you know, within the ministry. They stopped coming because they said people didn't say hi to them. They quit because they thought they were staring down at him. I mean, if my eyes hurting and if I have to squint, and then I'm looking your way because, you know, does that mean that, you know, I'm staring you down? You know, do I have something against you? No. Why? Because let's look at verse 3, Galatians 6, verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something when he is not, then he deceives himself. Too many people think that you are something. You know, too many people want to be big shots. But... You know, in the Bible, you're a little shot. I'm a little shot. In the sight of God, we're tiny shots out there. And you know who was a prime example who learned that in the Bible? Apostle Paul. Let's go to 1 Peter. Now we're looking at two passages. Have your finger on 1 Peter and have your finger on 2 Peter. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and we're going to look at 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. As a Bible-believing Christian, you can't quit. Don't give up. Amen. I mean, it's the truth that you found. It's so precious. And there are millions of people looking to find the truth. And they're still, you know, looking for it. But you found it. Amen. And why do you want to give this up? especially for many, many petty reasons. If I were to preach and if I were to teach something contrary to the Word of God, there's a definitely a case. You don't want to be at a church where it teaches false doctrine. You know, that's given. But because of your personal feelings towards certain people that, you know what, I can't go through with my faith, then you're a fool. I mean, God has given you, like, you know, well, what do they say? Blank check. Because you're going to cash it when you go to heaven, right? And you get a glimpse of it here living on earth. Why would you want to give that up? Right. Right? Let's go to 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. The Bible says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Let's go to 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. You see the difference. First one, he just says Peter. Second one, he has Simon Peter. Like a little sand, you know, Simon. Now he's starting to understand more and more. He's, as the ministry grows, as, as his faith goes longer and longer, Peter realizes that, you know what? I'm not a big shot. If, if he even thought he was a big shot, now I got to remember who I was. I was Simon Peter. You have to remember who you are. I mean, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Whatever I am right now, doesn't change what I was. Right. I'm, I was still a sinner saved by grace. I'm still a sinner saved by grace. Yeah. I just have a different role than everyone. You have your own role as well. Amen. But I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. We're all same sinners. That's right. 
if Apostle Peter had any idea that because he's doing this great work for God, he thought, I'm just a Peter, he realized right away. Or throughout the ministry, he realized in 2 Peter, I'm Simon Peter. I have old men still in me. I mean, what does Simon represent here? Old man. That's who he was. That's who he is. You and I still have old nature that we have to kill each day. We have to defeat each day. If you just says, you know what? I'm just the same person. Everything's good. You're going to lose. You're going to give up one day. You have to make sure that you understand. I am still that Simon. Even though I'm Peter, I'm still having that Simon in me where I won't have to get rid of Simon or I won't get rid of Simon until the day of rapture, Amen. until I go to heaven. Right. And he said apostle, but what's the difference in 2 Peter 2.1? He said a servant and an apostle. Now he's realized, man, you know. You know, when you just hear the word apostle, that's pretty fancy, right? You know, I mean, you want to be called apostle brother? You know, hey, call me apostle Jim, you know, call me apostle, you know, Jennifer, you know. No, no, no. Because we have a lot of false women, you know, pastors and, you know, prophets this day and age, right? But Simon Peter, Peter understood that I'm a say person, but as I grow older and older, the more servant that I am and I need to be. Amen. Why? Who's his master? Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Servant literally means a slave to a master. Yes. Right? You and I are slave to Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. whether you like it or not. Hey, I mean, because you can't just think that, because some people think that, you know, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. And then you feel so proud, you know. I mean, I, 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 I see it. You know, you're associated with Lord Jesus Christ, who's King of kings and Lord of lords, the creator of the universe. You know, he lives within you. He's your savior. But you can't be like haughty and proud in front of people. I'm servant of Jesus Christ. I'm better than you. You're not. You're just a sinner saved by grace who Lord has given you grace to be a servant. Technically, you're a slave to him who needs, who needs to do everything that he tells you to do. Yes. You have no free will when it comes to serving the Lord, especially if you put yourself in during the days, you know, when servant, master, those relationships were there. But we actually could do it out of free will. Amen. I mean, that is a big difference. Yes. You're not forced to do it, by the way, right. everyone. Amen. You know, you have free will to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Amen. You have free will to serve him like you should. Thank you. Yeah. But you are going to be identified as servant of Jesus Christ. So if I have a title and if I don't fulfill that title, then I haven't done my job. I have my will, free will to be the servant as the servant of Jesus Christ, not be the servant as the servant of Jesus Christ. And going back to, you know, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, you have to remember, there are people who's going to be weary in well-doing. You are going to be weary in well-doing. Yeah. We call that burnout many times. You're constantly doing well-doing. You're constantly being good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith, especially unto brethren. But when you face people like verse 3, who think of himself to be something, you got to get hurt. Amen. You gave your all out of the good heart, a servant of Jesus Christ. But there are certain people who's not going to appreciate it like you. They're going to take advantage of you. Yeah. And they're going to hurt you. Yeah, sure. 
Body of Christ is not perfect. Body of Christ will hurt each other yes. all the time. But Bible says those people are there. So you shouldn't be surprised. I'm sorry if that happens to you. But that's part of Christian life. Amen. In marriage, you're going to fight sometimes. Yeah. That's part of marriage. But do you get divorced? No. Like a lot of people? They do. Right? This day and age, people quit their marriage all the time. Yes. I mean, we know percentage is a lot higher than 50% nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 okay, if there are 10 people who just got married, you know at least five, minimum five, maybe six, seven, even eight. Yeah. They'll separate eventually. They gave up on each other. Right? So that's, that's happening. But unfortunately, that's happening in Bible-believing churches as well. Yes. Then it is given that there's going to be people quitting. Quitting the ministry, giving up their faith. So where do you stand today? That's the question. Because you have to check yourself each day. If you suddenly think that, you know what, you know, I never thought about it, but I'll never do it. Okay, you're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so every time when people give up, it's not because suddenly it happened. It always takes time. Amen. Just like backsliding, it takes time. Yes. So if you don't check yourself about giving up and preparing yourself not to give up, then one day, when that big temptation, big hurt comes in your life, you may just give up everything. Amen. Because it's easy to give it up. I've seen, and you've seen many people, who you thought was the strongest Christian. But for weirdest reason or the smallest reason, they just give up. Right. You've seen, you know, if you talk to people, You've seen, you know, right hand of many great men of faith, whether it's, you know, Dr. Ruckman, you know, past senior Kim, because we've been in the ministry for a long time. I mean, they gave up. They quit. Why? Oh, you know, I have personal issues with this brother, this sister. You didn't have it when you were growing up in the faith. Like first few years, you never talked about it. But once you got big-headed, once you thought you were something, oh, you know, this brother and this sister, they shouldn't be dressed that way. They, why aren't they coming to street preaching? You know, why aren't they doing visitation? Why aren't they reading their Bible five times a year like me? You know, you know why aren't they, you know, giving tithe, you know, more than 50%? I mean, now they become so self-righteous. Yeah. Once tough thing happens in their life, they just blow up and quit. And it reminds me that once you start rejecting Lord's conviction and correction and reproof, your heart's going to get eventually hardened. And so you got to make some decisions that you thought you'll never make beginning of your Christian walk. Because when you're little and baby, you're scared of a lot of things. You know, you're more cautious. You tell a little kid, hey, you know, I want you to do this. But they have never done it before. And they have this sense of uneasiness, uncertainty. So they're going to be more careful doing it. Just think about people who's driving for the first time. You, know, you don't want to be around them, right? They're going, following the speed limit, but less than five miles than speed limit. You know, 35, they're going 25, and you're right behind them. You're in a hurry. And every time they come to a stop sign, they don't know what to do. They're looking at their driving teacher. Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I go straight? 
and then five seconds later, suddenly left turn signal comes on, and you're stuck behind them, but they don't get into accident. They're being very, very careful. Who usually gets into accident a lot? People who've been driving for a while. Yes. I know these roads, you know. I've been driving, you know, commuting from work every single day for past 10 years. Like, ah, you know, that's a yellow. I always pass that yellow, you know. They know I have the right of the way, you know. <laughs> and suddenly, that yellow today turned red very fast. I'm like, you know what, I'm still gonna go. And you get hit, but it's your fault. You went through the red light, but you thought you were always okay. That's what happens to a lot of Christians. Now you start driving back and forth from your work. You start driving back and forth, and this becomes part of your life. And you start thinking that you're something. You know, I got it all figured out. You know, you never all figure out until the day of rapture. Yes. You don't. You think you figure out the whole Bible? No. I mean, as you grow as a mature Christian, you might know a little bit more than baby Christians but you're still figuring out. I'm yes. still figuring it out. Yes. So you have to understand that I cannot keep up. But the fundamental question comes up now. Why should you not give up? Right? Why are you here? Because you don't want to give up something. Right? Why are you somewhere? Because you don't want to give up something. So one, we are here because we don't want to give up what? We don't want to give up God's will. That's why we're here. We're here because of God's will. You and I are saved because of God's will. Amen. Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants every person to be saved. Then our purpose in life is what? To do God's will. That's it. When you don't do God's will, then you, you're going to start giving things up. But when you're willing to do God's will, no matter what, what circumstance, what situation, then you're not going to give up. How can people who's going through such a persecution and torture and suffering for their faith currently and in the past not give up their faith for Lord Jesus Christ? Because they knew that I'm in God's will. Because they follow God's will. And they believe in God's will. And they did not give up God's will. You and I have different callings in our lives. You may be called to be a preacher. You may be called to be a, just a Christian supporting the church. You may be called to teach. You may be called to do something. Everybody's called to preach. The gospel, for sure, though. Then, if you know your calling, you have to follow God's call. You have to follow God's will. Then what does that mean? You have to give up your own will. If you don't want to quit, you have to give up your will. You have to follow God's will. You have to let God's will take over your own will. Your own will has to be always after God's will. And when that happens, your own will literally disappears. For example, families. It's God's will, as man, head of the household, you provide for your family. Yes. Amen. If you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, you're going to see it. There's lazy bums out there yes. being a busybody, men not working. Right. It's God's will that you do it. Amen. Sometimes finances get hard. You do your best, God's going to provide your needs. Amen. You can't be sitting on your bum, watching TV, asking for checks to come in. That's not going to work. Right. Then you're going to blame God. God, I'm a Bible believer. I go to a Bible believing church. But you haven't provided my need. So I'm going to give up. I ain't going to that church anymore. I'm going to go to some different churches out there. Maybe they'll support me. Maybe if I go to those churches, you know, my bank account will grow. 
and people leave for those type of reasons. So one of the things that as a man, you have to protect your family, keep the family, stand for the family. And as a woman, you have to submit to your husbands. A lot of times, families break up because, number one, man doesn't do his job, and number two, woman doesn't do her job. There's no in-between, right? Children, at the end of the day, if you raise them the right way, you know, it's up to them. Especially after 18, they leave your nest. It's up to them, right? You've done your job as a parent, yes. right? But however, as you know, parents, when you raise your kid, you have to stick it out until Lord resolves it. Yes. As couples, you have to stick it out Amen. until Lord resolves it. Yes. My wife is always a nagger. You married her. You didn't complain when you were getting married. I never heard any marriage vows where someone says, you know, through naggings and through everything, right? <laughs> because you don't really go through nagging, right? You don't think about it when you're getting married. No. Both ways, you know, men are naggers too. Yes. You don't think about that. You just say, I love that person. I love that person. <laughs> I mean, well, the vows are, you know, universal, right? For good you know, or bad, for worse, you know, then you have to accept it. That's part of marriage. And you have to, so again, you can't give up your marriage, your family, and your children. Because some parents give up, their, give up on their child. I'm sorry, I understand. Some kids are like the devil, right? Even though they grew up in the church, even though you taught them the right way, even though you witnessed to them, you know for sure that they're saved, but they're your responsibility. They have your blood. They have your last name. What are you gonna do? You're gonna kick them to the curb? You have to do your best no matter what and let the Lord resolve it. So unless you stick it out, unless you endure, persevere, and you let the Lord handle it, and then you stop before Lord handling it, then you're a quitter. You quit. You gave up. That's why if anybody who's here and who's listening, if you had any reservations, if you had any possible thought of giving up on your family, that includes your marriage and your children, then you have to get rid of that feeling. Amen. You have to change your mindset. Yes. How am I going to do better? How am I going to, you know, stick this out? How am I going to endure? How am I going to lean more on the Lord to Amen. resolve this problem? Yes. Because you have to. Again, just statistic-wise, you know, more than 50, 60% of marriage ends up in divorce. Simple as that. What does that mean? When it comes to family life, marriage life, people don't care anymore like they used to. They just give up. You know, back in the 50s, you know, I mean, even maybe 60s, before the hippie generation. Yes. I mean, people, even though they weren't saved, they tried to keep their marriage yes. and the family because they knew that was right, because they made the vow. You go to more like, uh, you know, conservative, staunch areas, you know, like Asian countries, you know, South American countries, you know less liberal, liberalized areas, they stick it out. Yes. The guy is the worst husband i ever seen. Yeah. The wife still sticks it out. Yeah. Right. Majority of the time it was the guys because they go out and work and they do stuff. I mean, they're the one who's committing you know, fornication and adultery and yes. stuff. But for the sake of the family and keeping the family, they didn't want to keep up. This day and age, it's all about, what is the term they call? Some personal differences, you know? Yeah, hey, yeah, irreconcilable differences. Oh yeah, our characters don't match. 
you know. We don't laugh at the same thing. We don't smile at the same thing. We don't like the same food. We don't talk about the same thing. You know, he's a liberal, you know. I'm a conservative, you know. Like, those are not grounds for separation. I mean, if the other person leaves you, that's different. You've done your best, but they just leaves you. I mean, what can you do, right? Yes. But as long as you have the ability to not give up, you can't give up. You yourself should never give up. Not everybody. You can't think for your spouse, per se, but you yourself as a husband, as a wife, in a biblical way, as long as you know, there isn't like heavy physical abuse, you know, adultery and those things going on, and you can't give up. What else? People give up on their jobs too easily. <laughs> no one say you're going to get a perfect job in your life. Right. Then we would all be happy every day doing the things that we love to do. But majority of the people, you, you go to work because you have to make ends meet, yes. right? And as long as you can make ends meet and doing the things and it's not hurting your relationship with the Lord and don't interfere with church ministry per se, then you stick it out. What can you do? Yeah. I have a horrible boss. I mean, until you get a different job with better boss, you stick it out, right? I had a horrible commute. Until you get a different job, you stick it out. You can't just quit in the middle. I mean, if you have a different thing lined up, you know, you do it. And don't be that person, ah, I have a faith in the Lord, so I'm just going to quit. It doesn't work like that. That's not a balanced Christian life. You have something in ready. That's why you're quitting to replace it. Because what if after you quit, you have no source of income for six months, for one year? What's going to happen to your family? Right? Yes. I mean, what's going to happen to you? And for young people, schooling, right? You know, we don't emphasize too much, but if you start it, your college, you finish. You start it. If you start at high school, you finish. You start middle school, finish, right? I mean, elementary, without saying you finish, right? You just finish what you've started, Amen. whatever it is. Yes. I mean, there's reason why you started, because you had a goal in mind. Yes. Then fulfill that goal. We always become these human beings this day and age where if it gets too hard, if going gets tough, we just say no. We just drop everything and we just quit. True. That's not a Christian way. Amen. i tell you a story. You know, when East German, after the war, came to America, he was looking for a job. And then he got a job. And then he asked the employer, what are the hours? Well, yeah, 40 hours a week. You know what that person said? Well, is that a part-time job? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nowadays, we're all talking about government. Everybody talking about, let's drop it to four days, you know? Yeah. Let's drop it to three days, you know? What are you going to do during other days? You just want to play, huh? Yeah. You just want to do stupid stuff. Yeah. I mean, many times, not everybody. <laughs> You know, if we, if we see the workers in the Word of God. Like, you know, we see some parables and stuff that Lord uses. People working at the yard and stuff and the farm. Yeah. And back in the first century in Israel, you know what their workers were? They worked 72 hours a week. 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Six days a week. You know how countries like Japan and Korea were able to rebound after the war. People were crazy hours. They just work and work and work. And they look at America and parts of Europe you know, where they take like three hour lunch and coming back for, you know, after siesta, come back for work a little bit. And then they have three day 
weekend, every, every work week. And, and then now you see their econ economies and you say, what's wrong with it? Because people are lazy and they don't want to work. Yes. And I, I mean, obviously there's always union and all those issues, but generally speaking, when people are diligent in the country, it's going to do well. Amen. When people start becoming lazy, and when the funds have to be spread to lazy bums who doesn't work, then there's problem with the economy, right? Yeah. So that's why wherever you are, you can't give up on your work. If it's not right fit, work harder. Get more certification. Yes. And get apply for a different job. Amen. Don't be always complaining about it. Yeah. Do you think people around you will be blessed with your complaining ways? No. I mean, do you think people around you who wants to know more about what you believe always hears you about murmuring yeah. about your boss, your coworkers, and all that stuff? That's not going to help. Until Lord gives you opportunity, gives you that solution, you have to stick it out. You have to endure. That's the part that people can understand. They don't pray and they don't follow God's lead, God's guidance, and God's will. They just try to do it on their own. And if it doesn't work out, they blame God. They blame church. They blame the pastor, pastor's wife. They blame people who are sitting next to them, you know, every Sunday, right? And then they blame people sitting in front, behind. They blame the empty pew somewhere. They try to blame everything else except themselves. And then they say, that's my reason to give up. And I hope you don't think like that right now. Because if you don't give up your own will and your own desires through prayer, through the word of God, you know, through preaching and Bible study, one day you'll give up. One day I'll give up. It doesn't matter how long I've been a Christian. It's very easy to fall. Yes. It's very hard to build up. Your Christian walk. That's true. But falling down is super easy. Yes. It's like this, you know, if you're going up and hiking a mountain, it is very steep, right? Mm -hmm. You know, some mountains, you know, I don't know, let's say Mount Whitney, right? It's a tall mountain. And then you're doing really hard, but you let your guard down, you know, and then you, you don't keep your balance like you should have. And then you start rolling down. Quick. Man, I was like at 10,000 feet. Oh, I'm already at 9,500. That only took me like a few minutes. And then you don't be careful and you come down, come down, come down again. And then what happens? As a Christian, you're literally at the starting point when you got saved, your faith. But with a lot of baggage now. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, thou shall he also reap. Man, you reap so, I mean, you sow so many sins in your life now. You're starting over, but with sins added to you. And you have to wait until he reaps too. And that's a tough situation. In that point, at that point, many people will quit. Now, you know what? Lord, ah, it's tough enough. You know, it's tough enough starting over, but it's more tough that I actually have to reap what I've sown. Instead of acknowledging it, right? You know, I deserve it because I'm the one who sold it. You know, just give me grace, Lord, and mercy to sow, I mean, reap as little as possible and give me strength to persevere to go through with it. And I want to finish. I don't want to give up. But many people will just give up. And a lot of people don't follow God's will and finish God's will. It's because they're only hearers. Yes. They don't do it. It's like your heart is moving. I know. I was in that boat. Many, many times. I knew what was the right thing to do. You know what's the right thing to do. You hear the preaching. You feel the Holy Spirit conviction. You know the 
you know, Bible teaching. You're, you, you know you have to do it. Yes. But you don't transfer it to your works or your doings. Mm -hmm. You just hear only and you just stop. That's why you quit. When you don't put it into action, you can't finish. When you don't put it into action, there's no progress. And when you don't put it into action, it just becomes dead. You know, the prime example are machines, like digital machines, computers, or whatnot. If you don't use it for a long time, you can't really use it anymore. Somehow, like something about these electronic product, you have to use it to keep it operating. If you don't use it, battery dies more quickly, and it just doesn't work anymore. As a Christian, I don't know what, are you, what you're doing. Are you just listening only? It is great to be a good listener. We, we don't have enough of good listeners, right? But don't stop there. You have to put into action what you've heard. I mean, if you had issues with your family, okay, it's good that you admit it. Marriage, children, good thing that you admit it. Holy Spirit convicted you. Now you're willing to do it. Then do it. Don't wait until, Lord, I'll wait until my heart feels more right. Man, those are the type of people like, who never get saved in the first place, right? You know what? I appreciate everything that you told me about God of Jesus Christ. I don't want to burn in hell. I'm not ready. You hear that all the time. I'm not ready to do it. When are you going to be ready? When? You do it. When, especially when your flesh, as a Christian, when your Simon tells Peter, don't want to do it, then you say, no. You listen to Peter. Amen. I'm going to say no to you, Simon. I'm going to do it. You tell your old nature, I don't care. You, your old nature is going to tell you, okay, okay. New nature, it's fine that you feel sorrowful. It's fine that you're convicted. It's fine. You know, you want to get right with the Lord. Just stop there. Don't take any actions. Just come back next Sunday, feel the same way. And that's how Christians have become. You come Sunday, Wednesday, and then you hear great preaching and teaching. Man, I feel good. Lord, thank you. That's it. And then you live your life the same way because you don't change anything. Right. You're still mean daddy, bad daddy, yeah. mean mommy, bad mommy. You're becoming an un, I mean, disobedient kid continuously, just the family side. You don't work hard at work still. You know, you're the lazy bum. People know you as someone that can't be trusted. Like those things. At school, you, you don't do your best. You're getting D's and F's, you know. Yeah. If you do your best, I don't care. You're going to pass the class. Yes. You might not get A's. You might not even get B's, right? But I know God has given you brain to pass the class, right? You're going to pass if you do your best. Yes. But well, you know, I'm still getting F's and D's, you know. It's you. It's you who's not taking action. Then I'll go quickly. So one thing that you can't give up is living in God's will. You can't give up God's will. Amen. Then how can you not give up God's will? So first thing is you can't love the world. Amen. Number one, you can't leave the world. Right? Demas left because he loved the world. And don't tell me you're better than Demas, man. I'm no better than Demas. But once you start loving the world, you're going to give up. You're going to give up this faith. So don't love the world. And there's so many temptations out there, I understand, right? But God will give you strength and grace. And he promised in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. When there's no temptation taken you, but such is common to men. And don't think that you're the only one who's going through it. There are many, many others going through the same thing. And God is giving you a way out to go through it, give you strength to go through it. So do not love the world. How are you going to be in God's will continuously? Second thing, 
You can't compromise. Do not compromise. Amen. We have a good example in the Bible, Jehoshaphat. And you find him in 2 Chronicles. Go home. We don't have time to go. You could check it out when you go home. Chronicles chapter, 2 Chronicles chapter 17 and 18. He started off very well. Yeah. He, got, he got rid of high places. He wanted to serve God. But when chapter 18 comes up, you know what happens? I mean, now he has like all the riches. He's doing really well. He made affinity with Ahab, who's the husband of Jezebel, one of the most wickedest person. Their family got connected through marriage. Compromise. And then after that, he went downhill. You as a Christian, you might be doing well in the will of God right now, but if you don't consider yourself nothing continuously, and if you don't, you know, continue doing good works, what's going to happen? You're going to start compromising. Yes. You suddenly don't rely on the Lord. He relied on Ahab. That's what's going to happen. You, you were relying on the Lord for everything, but suddenly everything's going good. Now you start having your own mind. Oh, you know what? i got to shake hands with Joe Biden. He's going to help me. You know, I could reach out to more people, right? Gavin Newsom, shake his hand. Joe Austin, you know what? You know, he doesn't seem that bad anymore. You know, I have as many followers like him. I make as much as money, you know. Maybe I could turn them into a Bible believer. You know, maybe my kid could marry his kid now. Now we become, you know, you know, family now. Good idea. What happened? Downhill. Yes. So that's an example. Don't compromise, right? Amen. Right? If you don't want to compromise, then you have to follow the whole word of God. Yes, just sir. follow everything in the Word of God, yes, right? Sir. Don't just pick and choose. Just follow everything. Yes. And then thirdly, you have to endure any situation you're in if you don't want to keep up. You just have to endure. You have to persevere. I know it's easier said than done. But no one said your Christian walk is going to be easy. Right. I mean, if it was so easy, why did the Lord have to shed his precious blood? Why did he have to be tortured and not recognizable yes. for you and me? It wasn't going to be easy. The Lord never said our work's going to be easy, but he said he'll give us strength to go through it. Amen. I can do all things through the cry, which strengthens Amen. me. Then whatever situation you're in or you're going to be in, you have to endure it. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You have to endure. You have to if, if we're digging tunnel, we have to get until we see the light. Yes. And sometimes we don't know where the light's going to be, when the light's going to show up. We have to keep on digging. Yes, sir. Our fingers will be bleeding. Our knees will be aching. Our backs will be aching. But we continue to do it. Because the Lord kept you alive. He has a, something planned for you still. If he had no reason for you to be here, then you and I will be in heaven. But the Lord still has some plan for you here to bring him glory. Amen. Still giving you a chance to be in his will and follow his will and obey his will. Then you have to keep on digging. You have to keep on going. You have to keep on plowing. You have to just progress. Sometimes it's only a millimeter per day. Sometimes you take a seat back, and then, but you got to go continuously. So if you don't want to give up, no matter what the situation is, you have to endure. And all this, obviously, without saying, includes praying, reading your Bible, good heart preaching, Bible study. So those are given. So you, you have to include all of that. And lastly, if you don't want to give up, stop sinning. Amen. That's it. You got to stop sinning. You know. I mean, if, if you have some sin problems right now, go to First John 1 night. I mean, just if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive us our sins and to cleanse us while I'm righteous. Just do it. Amen. You got to stop sinning if you want to finish this race. If you don't want to give up, you got to stop sinning. Whatever sin that you're doing, you got to stop. Yes. 
Whatever sin that you've been doing every other month, you got to stop. Yes. Every half a year, every year, or every other year. Because certain sins, you only do it, like, rarely, but you still do it. But that rare moment could injure faith once yes. and for all. That rare moment could end you, and you're going to give up. In conclusion, what is it? When... When you give up, you'll never be happy. I tell you that. As a saved Bible-believing Christian, King James Bible, who's been in the local church, if you leave and give up your faith, even if you have billions of dollars, I haven't really seen a people with a lot of money die happy, honestly. They don't die happy, and especially if they're not saved. They're like, oh, man, I have to leave this earth. I've created billions and millions of dollars and I can't even take it to the grave. Oh, I feel so, you know, cheated that I can't give it to me and enjoy it in death. Ooh. See? That's what money does to you. Yes. So, don't, I mean, that's why even if you're a bible believing Christian, but if you give up, even if you have billions and millions of dollars, you are not going to be a joyful Christian. All you're going to think about is, man, why did I? leave the church? Why did I give up the faith? You know, why didn't I stand? Why didn't I just persevere? Because once you quit, it's very hard to come back. Think about it. Think about all the people who left the ministry. I mean, we have like one special case, that's it. Rest of them, hundreds of people, they're gone. So don't think that you kind of be that one special person or a special person. You're not that strong. And God has to give you that grace and mercy. Because if you give up, you have no excuse to God. God does not owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything. He died for me already. Yes. He gave me eternal life. What else? He gave me perfect word of God, King James Bible. Amen. Local church yes. gave me the opportunity to preach freely in this free country right now. Amen. Without persecution, I'm talking about real persecution, man, then all we could do is, you know what? Lord, thank you for reiterating. Thank you for reminding me that you know, I can't give up. Yes. I can't let my flesh, I can't let the world, I can't let the devil, and I can't just the pleasure for a season stop me from enduring and persevering and just finishing for you. I can't give up. Don't give up. If you were at the you know, edge of a cliff trying to, maybe you thought you're going to give up, you have to turn around. The Lord's giving you a chance. And once you turn around and set your mind that I'm not going to give up, Lord, in every part, not just one area, every part of your life, then you're going to see changes. Because you can't be hearers only. Amen. You have to do it. Let's pray. Dear Father, many times we give up, Lord, different parts of our lives, Lord. We just give up and we try to blame others for it. But your word said, you know, we shouldn't think like we're something. We're nothing. I mean, we're literally less than nothing. We got to understand we reap what we sow. And we shouldn't be weary. We have to finish the race, Lord. We don't want to faint, Lord God. I pray that every one of us will realize that our goal and thing that we shouldn't give up is being in your will and following your will no matter what. Heavenly Father, if we need to get right with you, and I know we do, help us get right with you. And help us not to be hearers only, but doers also. And just finish the race so that we'll be found faithful servant, Lord. Bless the rest of the day and the services. And above all, we want to see you right now, Lord. Even so, come Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.